Um, so, yeah. So we'll be talking a bit about how we've used the, the Econo model as part of D2L's uh, research and design. Um, just a quick introduction, introduction to ourselves. So my name is Tony Bergstrom. I'm a senior UX researcher here at D2L, like here and across the hall. Um, my background is in uh, human computer interaction. I did both of my, my degrees at uh, UAC, both masters and the doctorate. Um, I came up to uh, Waterloo following my wife, started working here at DTL. Um, and uh, mostly what I do here is uh, head up research projects to investigate things, help designers get insights into what it is they want to, uh, to look at and design, essentially. It's kind of a short version of it. But, uh, Aaron, would you like to? So I'm Erin, and um, I'm a senior product designer at D2L. Um, so I come from a background in visual design with degrees in psychology and adult education. Um, so I've had graphic design, interface design, and UX roles. Um, at D2L, I get to apply my passion for user research by designing um, friendly and intuitive experiences for teachers and students. Um, and I'm gonna provide some context around the product design team's decision to try the tool and how we tested it and what we learned. So this is probably the most transition heavy slide. We're passing the mic back and forth all the time. But uh, a little bit about Desire to Learn this. So Desire to Learn is a uh, uh, learning management system. It's essentially a platform, of integrated learning platform, so we like to call it, where we are working on changing the way the world learns. Um, so if you're local at uh, Laurier or, or Waterloo, you probably use our system. Uh, but we do we do higher education, we do K-12, we do corporate learning spaces, and it's really about connecting instructors to students, uh, providing a place for materials to be hosted online, providing a place to turn in assignments and you know assess assignments and essentially facilitate uh, the, the educational process. Um, also um, in the room here as well, we have uh, Bridget and Sarah who definitely works on, on some of the work that we've done in this presentation. Uh, I just had a, a, a baby on, on, well, my wife had a baby on Sunday, and so we, we were, just in case I'm too exhausted and I pass out, Bridget can certainly step up and, and fill in you know, my role in this talk, so uh, they, they were heavily involved in the work that went into this uh, presentation and, and such, and so we will move on at this point, I think. Before, before we get started, um, I'll give you a little overview of what we're going to talk about today. So, why um, why we decided to try a new model and why we chose to experiment with the Carnot model. Um, what we did, so we'll explain what the model is and a little bit of its background, how, um, how we used it, what considerations we had to make, um, and how we had to weave it into our interview strategy that we had already become quite comfortable with. Um, there's a lot of data involved in using the Kano model, so Tony's actually going to decipher what it all means for us. And uh, lessons learned, so if only we could have seen into the future, what would we have done differently? And why after using it, we believe it's a valuable research tool to add to our toolbox, and how it can be used to help influence business decisions. So if you just came to grab pizza, and you wanted to leave now, if you learned nothing else, the Kano model is another tool in your toolbox to gather a quantitative measure of delight, but it also does a fantastic job of prompting qualitative responses. So why did we bother? Um, like I said, we already have a toolbox um, full of methods that we are used to trying. So I'm going to give you some context around our decision to explore a new model. So first of all, um, last spring we had a new COO join the company. Um, with her, she brought a renewed focus on delivering great customer experiences. So with this request in hand to ensure teams deliver on delightful experiences, which includes designing delightful functionality, enjoyable interactions, and ensuring that these user-pleasing experiences get prioritized in the backlog, uh, we felt it was necessary to quantify delight. Um, as designers, we were confident in our ability with the qualitative feedback we got from traditional user interviews and prototype testing, but we felt it was important to have supporting quantitative data to take to our leadership teams. And fortunately, there was a project that had the breathing room to try something new. So my Sarah, uh, colleague Sarah and I were working on a project to help teachers in elementary and high school use our tool to facilitate student engagement and interaction. 
So when we started looking at the model, um, Sarah and I had already conducted over 20, 20 user sessions, Sarah and I and Bridget. Um, the first several of these traditional user interview sessions generated many iterations on the design, but the feedback on the latest iteration had plateaued. And we were no longer getting consistent or significant feedback to base further iterations on. We didn't yet have a de development team devoted to building the project, therefore we had the capacity to test the test and learn a lot more about our solution. So why did we choose Kano? So as mentioned, it was important for a product design team to be able to quantify delight so that as designers, we could ensure we were achieving it, but also it was important so that we could effectively prioritize delight in the backlog. In addition, the model would help us determine the expected and less relevant features. So for example, in our project, we had consistently heard from users which aspects of the design were the key delighters, but there were several other features that users didn't talk much about. Would these features get cut or deprioritized? How would users feel if these features weren't in the final product? And how could we know? Because the Kano model is a broader model of customer satisfaction, not just a way to identify delight, it would help us determine which features our users expected to be there. So uh, just to go into a little bit of background, what is the, the Kano model? Uh, if some people might have uh, some uh, conception of what it is already, Fine, but we'll just, just be review for you. If you don't, uh, then we'll just go into some of the details just so we don't lost a bit of the rest of the talk. So, what is the, the Kano model? Well, so the Kano model is a, a model of customer satisfaction uh, originally uh, designed by Noriaki Kano. He's a Japanese academic and consultant. Uh, this, the work that he was doing in the late 70s and early 80s was really just saying that uh, there's a bunch of features that we could include in our products, uh, but they're not all created equal. So how can we categorize them? What sort of impact can implementing these features have on the final product? Um, and so after his research, he came up with kind of uh, five different, uh, five basic categories. Well, I say basic, but one of the categories is basic. Uh, five categories for what these features uh, can be labeled as. And they have different effects on the, the loyalty, the satisfaction, and just the impact on the, the end customer uh, of how they perceive your product or your uh, things. So um, we have uh, basic, performance, attractive, indifferent, and reverse listed as the five different categories. Because of course, um, this is a, a, a Japanese uh, research. Uh, they weren't originally labeled in English, and so you might often see different labelings just as they've been translated differently. Uh, they will basically mean the same types of things. Whether it's you know, got basics or table stakes or must-have features or minimum requirements, it can be. Any of these, it's, it's fine. Uh, you might see them in, in the research somewhere, but uh, just know that they're referring to these broader categories. We'll talk mostly about the, the top three categories, because uh, those are the ones that are often pursued. Um, so to understand how the Kano model is actually set up, it's typically, uh, if you've seen any graph, this is the graph you would have seen, where you, uh, on the x-axis, you plot uh, the unimplemented to the full implemented imp implementation of a feature whatever that feature might be. So if you don't do anything, where's it going to be? If you do all of it, where's it going to be? And on the y-axis, you've got how satisfied the customer is. They're either extremely, extremely satisfied, extremely not satisfied, or somewhere in the middle. And so this gives you a, a sense then, as you implement a feature, what that feature does to customer satisfaction. So of some of those categories we were talking about, then, so for, say, a basic feature, uh, this is the type of thing that, like, it's basic, it's table stakes, it's kind of must-have features. These are the things that if you don't have them, then people are certainly not going to like your product. But if you do have them and you do them really well, and you're fully implemented, you're also not going to get extreme satisfaction. Like at a fully implemented state, you might have like, yeah, it's kind of what I expected. So if you were talking about cars, for example, um, an example of a basic feature might be a steering mechanism. You have to have some way to drive your car. Uh, if you don't have it, people don't like it. If you do have it, you do a fantastic job with it, yay, you're still stuck with the steering wheel. Um, in the D2L space, when we're talking about education, that might be for the LMS, you have a way to turn in your assignments, or you have a way to uh, record grades. Like, this is table stakes. It's what people expect to have in that product. And so you're never going to truly um, delight somebody by just doing that feature. Uh, performance features are, are slightly different in that uh, Essentially, the more you implement it, the, full, 
more fully you've implemented, the more satisfied you actually will have users, and you can reach uh, delight, certainly. Uh, this might be with the car, often cited, is gas mileage. Uh, and the more you improve gas mileage in a car, the happier clients tend to be, the happier buyers tend to be. Um, for D2L in the education space, you might use something like uh, integrating third-party tools so that people can more easily use uh, YouTube or SCORM packages or uh, Khan Academy or, trying, or wrapping things up uh, from other places and bringing them into the integrated learning platform. In a way, the more that you can offer, the more people have the, the ability to use and the happier they are because the things that they want to do are a part of that um, product. And then, then there's the attractive features, these the delighters. These are the ones where if you don't do it, people don't necessarily notice because they don't expect it to be there. So uh, once again, the car analogy, you might have self-driving cars. And I, I know this kind of goes against the steering wheel that I mentioned earlier. But <laughs> if you have, say, a self-driving car, that's not what people are expecting right now. Like, you don't expect that your car is self-driving. You expect that it could be. You should be delighted if your car can drive itself. Uh, but if you don't have it, it's not a huge loss because you're expecting to use a regular steering wheel. Um, but then the more you implement it, the faster you get satisfaction because it's entirely unexpected. And so these are the three um, basic, I say basic, but I keep it. These are the three main feature, types of features you'll see in the Kana model. Um, and it's important to know that it's really an expectation of this game. Like, if you don't expect it, then it will tend to be in the attractive category. And, and all these features tend to move downwards. So something that is unexpected now can become later more expected, become a performance feature, can become more expected, becomes a basic feature. So you're not going to get the same type of delight out of, out of, out of a uh, attractive feature now that you, wait, you're not going to get the same kind of delight 10 years from now from the same feature that would be attractive now because expectations change over time. Now, there are the two other categories um, that I mentioned. Uh, uh, reverse, the more you implement it, the worse people feel about your product, which you probably avoid those. Uh, and then there's the indifferent category, which is the more you implement it, the more people still don't really change their opinion of your product. So once again, you could avoid implementing that if you want. But uh, typically, you'll see it just the three. And uh, that's prob if, you've seen, if you've seen the kind of graph, that's probably the graph you've seen that kind of goes through it. So the question then becomes, how does it work? So that's, that's a fine theoretical framework, but how do we apply that to the actual designs that we're doing? You can't just, you just can't put that in front of somebody and say, which feature is it? Uh, so the way that we went about um, uh, categorizing is we put these in front of people and we ask them, uh, what do you think about it? It's not which feature is it, but it's what do you think about this, this feature? And the way we actually got at that uh, question uh, was using functional and dysfunctional questions. Uh, the format of this type of questioning is really, uh, if you could do this, how would you feel? But we ask it in two different ways. Um, we ask it with a functional feature, like this is with this is the product with the feature in place. So if you could automatically provide feedback to students based on their responses, how would you feel? So the feature in this case is having something that would allow you to automatically provide feedback to students either in discussions or in, in their assignments or whatnot. So it's taking some of the burden of, uh, of grading off, of, off your plate. So how would you feel about that feature if it was there? We kind of then rate that. And then the dysfunctional question is, if you, had to, if you provided personal feedback to each student's response, how would you feel? Now you'll notice that these aren't opposites. I'm not saying if you couldn't provide, automatically provide feedback to students, how would you feel? Because that's not a fair test. Like, the dysfunctional question is really the same system, it's just this feature hasn't been implemented yet. So how would you go about doing it? And so kind of with this pair of uh, responses, we can start to get at hints of how people might feel about individual features as we're going through. And uh, we have people rate uh, both those questions on uh, the final model scale of the post polar reactions, uh, which, once again, as this was originally translated from uh, Japanese, um, it's not always the most clearly worded, uh, but this is where we started. We actually included two different translations just to, uh, to be, try to be more thorough in what we offered. So it'll go from in, enjoy it and very helpful, expect it and basic requirements, neutral and doesn't affect me, tolerate it in minor can be just dislike and major inconvenience. Now, the key thing to keep in mind here is not, it's, the way the analysis is done, it's done like it's a Likert scale, like it's one giant scale, and, uh, but the important point to note is not really a Likert scale in the same way. It's not, 
just it's not one spectrum of one variable. It's actually capturing a little bit more nuanced data. Um, and we'll talk more about this, I think, in lessons learned. But uh, it's capturing on the top, on one and two, it's, it's did you like it? And four and five, did you not like it? But also, did you expect it? So one is, I enjoyed it, it's very helpful. Two, I expected. Expected, it's not quite the same as, um, it's not, it, enjoy it, very helpful, it's not just a stronger version of I expected it. And so there's actually, you're, you're capturing a little bit more nuanced data than just, just one uh, scale. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things we had to figure out before we could actually start looking at the problem. So um, going back to the last two slides, um, termin terminology and phrasing um, actually tripped us up a bit. So first of all, as Tony mentioned, the direct Japanese translations for the scale of emotional reactions actually sound kind of bizarre in English. Um, so we had to select the way that we wanted to phrase those options. Um, and we did end up settling on those two variations that we saw, as one didn't uh, suit all question types. Um, and another key thing is when working with those functional and dysfunctional questions, it can actually um, be quite challenging to pose the dysfunctional without sounding, well, dysfunctional. Um, so first of all, you can't ask the question specifically about the feature. You would then be asking, how do you like this feature if it's present? And how do you like this feature if it's not present? So we can't do that. Um, so you have to um, think about um, the experience of the product with and without the features. So also, if you just asked, how would you like the product with this feature? And how would you like the product without this feature? You're also seeding the answer. So we really need to try and think about the capability of the product without the feature and phrase the question in that way. So how do you feel about the product? How do you feel if the product does this? And how do you feel if the product does that? And also, we try to switch up the order, or we would like to switch up the order of functional and dysfunctional back and forth. Um, so swapping the this and that would actually be helpful too. And also because we ended up going with those two variations of the on the scale. Um, and the answers are not easily uh, remembered for the user because it's not a likelihood scale. We wanted to make sure that the options were visibly available for the user's preference. Next, we had to decide um, which features to test with. I'm giving away your story. I lost my mind. Okay. Anyways, I'm going to wing this until I can find my mouse. Um, feature selection. So be selective. So as we know, we don't want to overwhelm the features. Um, we had very precious time with um, our participants, so we wanted to make sure that we didn't um, ask them about absolutely everything. So on our particular project, we decided to um, leave out some of the things that we had already heard in our qualitative data that were the delighters as well as those basic requirements. So and that ended up giving us more of a clustered analysis in the end. So we recommend using something earlier on, but being selective. Um, in addition, when you're selecting your features, um, you can't ask your users to judge those features um, and assess their relevance unless they actually understand what those features do. So plan in your strategy to make sure that you can actually, the users can interact with those features and understand the value, or you've done a cognitive walkthrough to make sure that the user understands their value. In addition, you want to consider pacing the questions. So in, when we first tried it, we just sort of stuffed it into our existing strategy. So we went through our regular um, prototype testing, and then we put all those common questions at the end. So we, we did everything, and then we went, oh yeah, let's go back to that feature, of that thing we tried earlier on, and ask the functional and dysfunctional questions. Um, what we found is that it's actually much more useful to ask the common questions directly after having the user interact with the feature. It makes it more present of, um, present of mind, and as well, you save time by not having to revisit that feature later on. And um, applying the model to a process. So, and this stuff is stuff you already know if you've been doing um, user testing of any kind. So first, we needed to find the right users who fit the segment we were solving for. So the researchers did a great job recruiting and setting up the sessions, and we did most of our testing remotely. 
So there's always a lot of planning um, and set up work for that. But essentially, we just wove the panel questions, panel questions into our interview strategy of getting to know our users, allowing them to interact with or explaining our prototype, asking the appropriate questions after each task. Um, we recorded our sessions. We took diligent notes. We analyzed the results, which Tony will explain in much more detail. And then the results are visualized in a manner that our stakeholders can appreciate, and we share those results during the decision-making process. Uh, I guess we were supposed to add a picture of me jumping up and down with glee. Um, but uh, yeah, so we have a bunch of responses then from, from running the sessions. So the question is, like, how do we then combine those into uh, some means of understanding how these features actually fall on the, on the curve. Uh, so we have, we have those uh, functional and dysfunctional responses. So for any individual uh, participant, we can, we can try to plot it then on, on this graph, just using, um, so we'll take those responses, say from the, the functional question, so when it is fully functional, and plot those on, on one side, and plot the responses of the dysfunctional question on the other side. And then, uh, with each pair of those, each each paired response, we get some sense of this the slope of the line that the individual person that we tested feels uh, for that feature. And there's there is a way that you can then categorize it. This is kind of what it looks like. I'm just trying to show it up here. Uh, if you start uh, with a dysfunctional question that they're kind of neutral about, but then with the functional question they are very uh, positive about, then that's an indication that it's probably an attractive feature. And likewise, if you start with their negative uh, against a when it's not the final uh, when, it's, when it's not implemented and they're negative, and it's implemented just kind of neutral, that's an indication of a basic feature. And then there's one pair that then allows you to say this is a, a performance feature. So this is kind of how the individual categories for the responses get uh, laid out. Of course, like any good researcher, you're doing more than just one participant to get quantitative data. Um, so you've got a bunch of different people that are responding with this. Well, how do you combine them becomes the question. Um, so luckily we were we were on a, a short time frame and found uh, Folding Burritos. Uh, so foldingburritos.com has a, is a Bayesian econo model with an Excel spreadsheet that does a lot of calculations for you. And for us, it just made it easier to, to kind of jumpstart and get into the uh, get into the process. Um, which certainly we can, we can take some of the analysis to, uh, techniques back and, and do it ourselves, but since it, it allows us to, to think more about what we want to do as part of the test and less about like, are we doing the calculations exactly correctly. Uh, so, so yes, this is a fantastic resource if you're looking to start into adding common tests to your, uh, to your protocols. Um, right, and so there's two types of uh, analysis that they provide in that spreadsheet that are uh, useful to leverage. The first is discrete analysis. And the screen analysis is really just saying, uh, for each feature and each uh, person you tested, uh, how often did it appear as an attractive feature? How often did it appear as a performance feature? And so in this case, uh, feature three, 60% of the time appeared as an attractive feature. And it's just a very simple count. It's kind of a gut check on uh, how consistent is your data kind of thing. Um, and, but unless your data is very consistent, then it's, you're going to lose some of the nuance because you are capturing it on a scale and uh, it's not just a category. So I would often recommend the continuous analysis, uh, but this will give you a general idea. Uh, and just some of the features that we're looking at, we can't, we're not going to go through all of them. And these are vague enough that it's not giving away anything that we can't share. So <laughs> uh, feature one, for example, was, uh, sorry, feature three was integration with uh, the Google Drive uh, as a part of this interface. Onboarding was an interesting one, uh, feature one here. You can see that 50% uh, of the responses were Q, which in this case is questionable, which uh, I believe I was, these tended to be that when it was not implemented, people really liked the interface. And when it was implemented, people really liked the interface. And so there's not a good way to necessarily interpret that. So in the, in the screen analysis, it shows up as kind of a, a questionable feature. We're not sure what to make out of that kind of thing. Which was an interesting point because there was actually a lot of effort put into trying to make the onboarding experience really uh, engaging and enriching. But after finding out that yeah, most people didn't seem to really like, get behind it that much, so it got deprioritized in favor of some of the other features that uh, we ended, ended up pursuing. Quizzes was also an interesting one. Um, quizzes is certainly a, a key feature of 
uh, desire to learn um, platform, especially for online courses. But in some of the previous research, nobody had really been talking about quizzes. In the uh, qualitative research, nobody had really been talking about quizzes. But providing it here, uh, it comes up more often. It's much more solidly indicating that it is an important feature to pursue. Now, I said uh, I would recommend continuous analysis. Kind of the, the thing about the continuous analysis, they they they, they rework the um, the axes into a slightly different visual metaphor. So, I've got another visualization to step through. The only reason I particularly want to include this here is because this is a, has been a fantastic graphic in explaining to stakeholders uh, the importance of features. So, you might not necessarily need it for analysis, but it is fantastic for explaining to others once you walk through exactly what this is. Um, so. Once again, you're plotting the satisfaction for the functional and dysfunctional questions. Um, it's actually, maybe it makes a little bit more sense if you see the table. So this is all the different combinations you can have of the responses to those questions. There's 25. Um, just like I explained earlier, if you, if you if on the, with the functional uh, responses, if you liked it, uh, but the dysfunctional, you disliked it, you see there's the P up in the top corner for a performance feature. Uh, so this is, essentially plotting out all the different categories. This is the same, same as I explained in that other graph, but a little bit different, if you will. So the continuous graph takes the, um, the functional and dysfunctional axes and kind of recenters here on that uh, combination in the top corner. Now obviously there's, there's fewer ways for somebody to say something is a performance feature just because it requires a certain combination of responses. Uh, and so they, to spread them out and make it more even, uh, it's, it's, the responses are reweighted. I'm not going to go into the math because I feel like walking through this part is a little bit dry as it is. Uh, but just just know that it's essentially weighted and rescaled to fit on a zero to four um, uh, plot with that same with that same center point from this chart moving into the center. And you can read this then as the must-have features in the lower corner around the performance, attractive and indifferent, and some indication then of you what order you might want. Certainly, you probably want to use a lot of the must-have features, to the basic features first, uh, and then work your way around and choose whether or not you want to get to the features people are in a different time. Um, so to give us a, a sense of what it looked like for that first project that uh, Aaron was talking about, um, the Fold and Burrito site, does, the, the Excel sheet does allow you to capture importance as well. So we didn't capture that in our study. So the size of the dots are all the same. But if, if you capture importance as a part of your questions, you have some additional information here. Um, but you can see that we tended to cluster a lot of uh, our responses in the performance and attractive features. That's because there was some preliminary um, removal of features and we were partially, partially through this project already to begin with. Uh, just to call out, call out some of the individual features that I talked about before, you see onboarding ends up as, uh, in the continuous analysis, it's attractive, but it's very close to being different. Uh, so it's certainly not one of the first things that you're gonna wanna Implement. It's being pulled over a lot because of the, the questionable responses. Um, so that's way over to the left side in this case. Uh, but you see, it's not. It's certainly not the first feature we want to start with, but it is something that we could could pursue later if we can prioritize at this point. Um, and then, of course, the Google Drive quizzing show the very solid uh, performance features that you might want to pursue more immediately. Um, so this is a project that we kind of added it to halfway through. Um, this is another project we had done, we, we added a little bit earlier, and you can, you can see you get a much broader distribution if you start it with a broader range of features. Uh, that before, you've, before you've started doing any sort of uh, really in-depth design, this will help you then focus on what is it that's really important to the users that you're targeting for, um, for that particular interface. some lessons we learned along the way by using the Kano method. So in this first experiment, on this first project, um, what did we get out of it um, as designers and researchers? So I actually learned a lot of, a lot, of, the new model actually helped me think about my project in a new way. So first of all, pros and cons of qualitative data. So although we chose the Kano uh, model for its quantitative data, um, using it actually gave us a lot of extra valuable qualitative information. 
Interestingly, what we found is that users spend more time actually talking about a feature and thinking about a feature when trying to choose and justify their choice on the scale of emotional reactions. Um, and the cons of qualitative data is that um, using the common model actually confirmed that qualitative data alone can be misleading. So as mentioned earlier on our project, the user interviews generated a lot of feedback on certain features, um, but others were not mentioned at all. So like Tony said, quizzing was one of those features, right? Um, that just didn't excite our users. Um, we believed it was important, but had we assumed that this lack of excitement from our users meant that wasn't important, um, the users would not have been satisfied with our product. Instead, the condo results identified features that were exceptionally important to our users, but just didn't get this delightful and qualitative interview. Um, second, um, what we found out is you definitely want to use it earlier than we did. So um, we could have learned probably even more about our project had we actually not been test driving the, the Conan method, had we actually um, had it at the beginning. Um, so being able to test earlier and testing with a, a wider variety of features um, would have resulted in um, a greater variation in results. So we saw that on our chart, it was quite clustered at the top there. Now that was okay because we had already just consciously decided to leave out some delighters and must-haves because we were trying to narrow our focus um, and, and, and understand those ones that we hadn't, um, hadn't heard a lot about. But it would have been nice to see a graph with that greater variation. So we do recommend using the model early. Um, and if you use it early, you can actually keep it very simple. Um, so test early with just words and wireframes, and if you do, you can actually test more ideas, and those more ideas will produce a greater variation of results. Um, we also learned um, some ways to help us use the Khan uh, method better. So this is almost just a recap of those considerations we had to think about um, in the beginning um, when we were using the model. So we already talked about how terminolo terminology and phrasing tripped us up a bit. So there's the challenges between distinction, uh, the distinction between um, expect and enjoy. So um, because of that challenge, there was a tendency for users to default to the Likert scale as a mental model to fall back on. Um, we also actually, when we showed them the options on the scale of emotional reactions, we did have the numbers beside them too, one, two, three, four, five, which actually reinforced that notion of a Likert scale. So we would recommend not doing that in the future. Um, and we also talked about the decision to use a single or multiple options for the scale of emotional reactions. So we try, we we did choose to use two options, um, but in using those two options, it actually, you know, although users could answer the question regardless of how we phrased it in a way that made sense to them, there was a lot there was a lot to remember. So we actually um, we did our testing remotely, and I actually like hid the scale in the prototype, and so we just click like, on an icon in the top right hand corner at any time to be able to access that scale after we asked them the kind of question if they couldn't remember exactly um, what that was. So you do want to take some extra time and plan well how to phrase um, the, those things, but also specifically spend some time um, phrasing those reverse or dysfunctional questions. Don't see the answers by making your product sound dysfunctional without those features. Um, it can be a tendency to do that. You might want to do that, um, you know, to get that feature in. But you don't definitely don't want to do that. You want good uh, good results, and try and swap the functional and dysfunctional questions between users. Um, lastly, when you consider how to pace your quantum questions through the testing, we recommend that um, you ask those questions immediately after interacting with the feature. Um, don't leave them all to the end, or you'll end up having to revisit feature functionality, taking up precious time. So be prepared in advance before applying um, the Kano method with your users. Um, all these things, things take additional time um, when developing your testing strategy. Another thing I wanted to talk about was the importance of articulating the approach you are taking to delivering on delay for your particular project. So I, I feel like I didn't articulate my approach um, well at the beginning, so I put some thought into how I could have done this better. So there are multiple ways to deliver on delight. One way um, would be to add attractive features to your product. 
Uh, well, one way would be one way to add an attractive feature to your product um, would be to um, take an existing um, sort of performance product. So if we go back and we look at um, Tony's example of gas mileage, so um, you would might want to take an existing performance feature and make that attractive. But because but how would you do that? If you just continually improve on this performance feature in expected ways, it will continue to sit on this line, making your users continually more satisfied but never really being attractive or delightful. So using Tony's example about cars, gas mileage is a performance feature, therefore continually making a car more fuel efficient won't improve gas mileage and move <coughs> gas mileage into delight. Um, but let's say you've come up with an innovative way to display fuel efficiency that makes it actually more obvious and relevant to the driver. This implementation could become delightful. So you might want to take this approach in product improvement projects when the goal of adding delight is to retain, retain existing users. Another way to add an attractive feature to your product um, would be to identify a new task. So one, perhaps your users do often, but don't expect to do with your product, and build that into your design. So with the car example again, um, let's, say you, let's say your self-driving car could drive itself <coughs> to the dealership to get service while you were at work. So that would be cool, right? So this approach might be used um, when you're trying to differentiate your product from the competitors in relation to your users. So one way we actually designed this into our project was to deliver analytics on student engagement to the teacher in context. So how does this relate to using the cloud model? So in the first scenario, um, the feature itself is still a performance feature. Therefore, you would want to ask one question about the availability of the feature and another about the implementation of the feature. So one question about the importance of gas mileage, another about the display of the gas mileage. In the second scenario, your counter questions um, can both be about the availability of the feature, so the importance of gas mileage and the importance of self-driving self-service cars. Um, but these aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Do both if you can. Um, but as we know, time and resources are limited. So when it comes to scoping effort and prioritizing your backlog with your development team, you often have to choose, right? Which comes first? And you want to make sure you get the right return on your investment of time and resources. So it's important to understand for yourself what aspects of your design are delightful and which of those delightful features should be prioritized. Is it the implementation of a performance feature or the addition of a new feature? And articulate this well with your stakeholders as well. And so Tony and I have talked about how to apply the Connor model and what designers and researchers can learn by using it. Um, but as designers and researchers, we don't work in isolated bubbles. To be valuable, our work must impact business decisions. We found the common model can help actually help us do that in two ways. One is to influence project direction. So if used early enough, um, it can actually tell you where to go with your project. As mentioned earlier, this can be at a conceptual stage when you're trying to understand what concepts are important to the user segment you're trying to solve problems for. Or you can do it with early wireframes to see if your early designs are on target. Um, since our initial test of this test, um, Bridget worked with one of our designers, Bob, to apply the quantum model to a competitive analysis exercise in the early stages of the concepting phase. So the results showed significant variability between features. So we saw that earlier actually on the chart with the, the chart with the variability and helped guide the project direction. And another way that we can influence um, business decisions is to influence project priorities and prioritizing features in the development backlog. It will identify those features that are expected by users of your system and highlight areas where you can exceed their expectations. In addition, it provides uh, data that helps teams think about balance and features across the spectrum of expectations from delivering the basic functional requirements to solving expected problems to delightfully surprise your users. So in conclusion, um, we learned a lot and we added a new method to our UX toolbox. 
um, the method works, but it needs tweaking. Um, we iterated along the way and expect that you would have to too um, if you tried a new context. Um, we found that it's a multi-purpose tool. Um, it can test for delight as well as validate the relevance of, of individual features. It can also gather valuable qualitative and quantitative data simultaneously. And it can be influential. So those visualizations of the results that we saw in the graph actually are quite impactful. Um, stakeholders really got drawn to that. It's something that you can go to um, a leadership meeting with and show them and see where those features sit. And it actually provides a lot of meaning. Not to say that those quotes you get from our qualitative data don't carry weight too. Those are really important. But if you put that quote beside um, that dot on the on the conograph, it um, really validates um, why certain features should be there, particularly if we're trying to prioritize delight. So we recommend you actually give it a try. So reach out and let us know um, if you do and what you learned. Um, we, we find it a valuable tool in our UX toolbox. And if you do, reach out. Here are some resources that um, you can use. Um, so as Tony mentioned, folder and burritos. But once again, a lot of these other sites have some really valuable information that you can use as well. And now I'll turn it over to you guys for questions. So, I'm wondering if you were going to compare this to sort of multi-dimensional scaling of the worst computers, of, you know, the sort of worst computers, and really scale that with MDS. Kind of how you compare this method to that method, or if you would. <laughs> So we only have one microphone. So the, the question was how would I compare the, the pairwise comparison to method to the the Kano method? Um, so I haven't actually done a lot of pairwise comparison work previously, so I, I don't have any immediate uh, opinions on it, but yeah, it very well could be because the data the data results that yep. you use from, that you showed from Falling Burrito look a lot like what you get when you run an MDS of uh, pairwise comparisons and right. I thought Maybe this is better. Maybe this is getting at something that I can't get at the other way. Yeah, like I, I've, not, I've not done that much work with Fairways uh, comparison. So the, I've not done as much work with that, so that I can't necessarily say to get it in Yes. So your clients are spread out over a very, very wide geographical area. Yes. Um, my company has the same problem. We're just getting into UX a couple of months ago and trying to ramp up. and, and uh, this presentation is perfect time for us. How do you get into your client offices to work with them on all this stuff? Do you usually use webinars, or how do you do that? Uh, so for the actual testing, then? Uh, yeah, for the interaction to get the to ask them the questions and, and so a lot of the testing we do. Um, well, so we have a lot of account managers that will reach out to them to see if there's anybody who's interested. We try to snowball. And basically, if we find somebody who's either highly connected at, the, at one of our client institutions, we'll ask them, like, can you send emails to a bunch of people to see if anybody's interested? Or uh, we will uh, reach out to people at, uh, so every year we have uh, a user conference for a lot of people to visit. And we'll talk to individuals there, and either use them in our studies, or we'll use them as, once again, hubs to find other people to use in our studies. Pass word along that way. We advertise on, on our Twitter feeds. We, uh, we reached out through Craigslist in some cases when we're looking for non-client um, participants. So it's really a matter of what type of person. And there, there, there are places to, to list for studies. Craigslist, just, just saying. But, um, so it depends on what, what what kind of participant we're looking for. Some are easier to find than others. If we're looking for a, a an instructor of a blended class, they're pretty easy to find. Here. If you're looking for an instructor who teaches more of a traditional class that doesn't have a lot of online components, they're still fairly easy to find, but they're a lot harder to reach because they don't tend to use as much online stuff, or they wouldn't be as connected to the people who are connected to the account managers as directly. So I guess the short version is you got to figure out what client you're looking for first, and then send an email to somebody who might be able to connect you. So how do you how do you work with them when you get connected? Once we get connected, uh, we we've used a variety of methods. Um, right now we're really big on uh, I think the product is called Zoom. Just it's 
it's uh, it allows you to do essentially <coughs> conferencing, video conferencing, audio, share screen, stuff like that. Uh, you can use Skype as well. We've used Adobe Connect in the past. Um, yeah, there's a couple other things. But yeah, basically any any sort of face-to-face -face conferencing that allows you to share your desktop tends to be uh, meet the requirements of what we need for what we do. Because okay. we can we can put a lot of prototypes up online somewhere and either access it from our side and share it through the document uh, through the desktop sharing aspect of it, or we can make it publicly available to them with a password and give them a link to it and they share it back with us, depending on what it is we're trying to test it with. You mentioned that it's good to um, look at certain features and ask questions immediately, prompt somebody immediately. Mm -hmm. um, is there a tension though with kind of interrupting the flow of the user experience there, and how would you navigate that tension around it? Um, yes, there was definitely some tension. Um, so that it was one of the reasons that we originally tried to just put them all at the end, right? Like let's just go through this um, experience, and then you know we'll ask you all these questions later because they are sort of awkward. We did have to introduce our users to the content. So we're going to be using this common model today to help assess the relevance and value of um, certain things in our product. We're going to ask you um, two sets of questions, and we're going to ask you to respond using this scale. So we definitely had to introduce that because it doesn't flow nicely, right? It, it definitely it sort of stops the flow of things. Um, but in our particular um, user testing, we actually had sort of tasks that we had the user going through anyway. So there was sort of like do task one, do task two, do task three. So there were t um, transition points in that. But even in those transition points, this sort of pausing to ask these odd questions, you know, do require some introduction. Um, and the first couple times in the study, so testing, I think, 13 features or 11 or 13 features, um, the first couple times there's a little tripping up, and you find that they're leaning back to the likelihood scale, and, and you ask some follow-up questions, um, and by the end of the interview, it, it goes a lot smoother. And not just for the user, but we got better at it, right? So it, it tripped us up a little the, the first few times we used it. We definitely got better at it as we, uh, as we went on. Did you, did you ever have a situation where, uh, let's say, a user thinks that the feature is nice or something, but then confronted with a prototype or a wireframe, he changed his mind? You know, or you read about uh, use cases like this? Um, it would be actually very interesting. We have, because we haven't been using it long, it would be interesting to look at sort of that second use case that we talked about, right, where we've done it with the competitive analysis got certain results, then build a prototype to input things into a, a prototype and find out whether or not. So it would be interesting to take that, that next project that we done, had done where we looked at the, the Kana model um, early in competitive analysis and then validate it again later on in the prototype. It could be the implementation of the prototype, right? It could just be the way you've designed or been on this interpretation of the feature, right? Which is why it's also important to make sure that the user understands the value of the feature to them when they're judging it, right? You can't just ask them, do you want it, and don't you want it, right? It's like, you know, this is what, this is how it's going to make your life better, right? Or this is how it's going to change your experience, um, and understand that in advance, and that could be a good change or a bad change. Does that answer? Yeah. That's sort of where I was going to go. Okay. Whether you can tease apart with this model, the feature intent versus the implementation that you showed, because they might find value in the intent, but not in the way it's implemented in this prototype. Is there a way for getting feedback from them that they would, they like this intent, but could they do this differently, or whatever, what if you did that? I, I think that's something that would come up in the uh, qualitative responses, is if they specifically say, you, what you're asking me here, yeah, I don't like this, but here's just, they, they might give us a story about, you know, but I can see it being useful in these cases. And so that would give us essentially the, the ammunition we need to kind of you know, iterate in one direction or the other based on, on that type of feedback. If you really wanted to tease out uh, the, the, the intent from the, uh, um, from the implementation 
maybe that you, you could also ask about the feature before you show it to the show them the feature and then ask them again, maybe with some separation or do two separate sets of individuals. But yeah, I I would just rely on the, the qualitative response to, to kind of give an impression of what they're thinking. And like compare like A B to different implementations for the same feature? Uh, I don't think we've done two yet, yeah, at least in the, unless unless Bridge has done anything in the new stuff. I was just wondering about using it as a model for prototyping to determine whether features you're thinking mm -hmm. to use the root one. Because that's sort of how the other two questions were going, but I right. know I need more we, we, We've done that. As far as the, if you remember the two scatter plots, the second scatter plot, I believe, was, was question based entirely. Was, there was no actual interface shown to individuals. It was really just trying to nail down what it is that we want to, to start looking at before we even choose. <laughs> Yeah, I think in that I think in that second one there were interfaces, right? But they were sort of paired back, stripped down, and they weren't you weren't using them. So it was like generally this is um, you know how valuable is being able to do this, right? Um, by just looking at you know a, a screen. So it was competitive analysis. We were looking at the value of okay, all the competitors do all these different things, right? You know, do we need feature parity with all of these things? Like, what is actually the things that are most valuable to the user segment that we were looking at? Um, so, yeah, that was done very early on. But we did see online when we were exploring that um, it has been done with like just sticky notes and words, right? So there's a lot of information online, but um, we haven't tried that yet. But there's different resources that can tell you how to do it earlier on and give you some advice around that. Thank you.